tuned into Quick Charge, the high voltage podcast bringing you the top stories in electric vehicles and sustainable energy daily. And it's all powered by electric. Welcome back to another extra long episode of Quick Charge. I'm your host, Joe Boris, and it's July 22nd, 2024. We're going to start today's news with the most significant new product launch I've seen in a while, the Cadillac Soleil all-electric convertible concept. Now, this is a rare electric convertible, but what makes it significant is not the fact that Cadillac's going to sell a million of them. It's not the fact that Cadillac is going to produce this thing. We don't even know if that's true. It's not even the fact that this is a convertible. What makes this significant is that it's the first concept car in a long time that really pushes the envelope of what a brand could be. And Cadillac, arguably more than any other brand right now, is in a crisis. Is it an ultra luxury brand? Is it a technology brand? Is it a high performance brand? They don't know. But what seems to be happening with the Soleil 2 plus 2 is that they're leaning in to ultra high end, ultra luxury And I am here for it. The company wrote at the unveiling of the car, today Cadillac introduced the Soleil concept vehicle, the ultimate design expression of coach-built luxury electric convertible. This imaginative design exercise pushes the boundaries of future bespoke commissions tailored to reflect the unique passions and interests of its clientele. Now, we don't get too far into this in the article, but... This concept of bespoke commissions is something that Cadillac is pushing towards. They want to be seen as an American Rolls Royce. They want to regain, reclaim rather, that standard of the world tagline that they had in this part of the last century. And part of that is vehicles like their new super expensive sedan that is commission only, that is hand selected leather, hand selected wood, custom paint, all of that. They're pushing into a similar thing to like Porsche individual that does this kind of customization of the product. And I think it's going to be very successful for them, especially as the number of people who can afford cars like this continues to grow. Now I've included here a comment by Cujo YYC. Love that. To my eye, it has a very fifties vibe, including the color and the long scarf waving in the wind. Imagine Jane Mansfield or Marilyn Monroe riding in a caddy convertible, wearing a long scarf. Absolutely nailed it. This is exactly the kind of thing that Cadillac has needed, really, that everybody else has needed. But if it seems familiar to you as you look at like the long lines, the long tail, that beautiful sort of swoop from the hood all the way back to the deck, there is something to this that we've seen before. And if you remember the Mercedes Benz vision concept of a few years ago, this has a very similar proportion. Now, this car is a two seater, two passenger, unlike the Cadillac, which is a four passenger, a little bit closer to production. And this is way, way pie in the sky. You've got these like razor blade, ultra thin camera stocks for mirrors, where if you go back and look at the Cadillac, that seems much more production ready. And it's really an interesting contrast because Mercedes Maybach concepts are meant to be that standard of the world, that ultra sort of luxury competing with Rolls Royce, competing with Bentley, and now apparently competing with Cadillac because you take one good look at this Soleil and tell me that it is not the love child of this beautiful Maybach Roadster and the greatest car of all time, the Chrysler TC by Maserati. So this is not an electric vehicle. This is from 1989. The seats look like two Sharpays or grandparents going at it. It is gross. But there is something about this car that 30 plus years after it was originally introduced makes it seem like something very classic, right? It's got clean lines. It's uncluttered. It's this like American Euro connection. And obviously the color is coming back, right? Because the nineties are in. So this is cool. And obviously I'm a huge Mopar guy. So being able to make this call out has uh, really brightened my day. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, moving on to the next thing. Cadillac is not the only company that's reinventing itself these days. Hyundai is absolutely rocking it. Ever since they rolled out the Ionic 5 and then that Hyundai prophecy concept that eventually became the Ionic 6, Hyundai has been going hit after hit after hit. And their latest EV, the Ionic 6, is already due for a refresh, despite the fact that to many of us, it still feels like a new car. The new Ionic 6 upgrade will feature a design overhaul inside and out, faster charging, and even more range. 
Hyundai's Ioniq 6 is already one of the most energy efficient EVs on the market. In fact, according to the U.S. Department of Energy, the 2024 Ioniq 6 long range rear wheel drive with 18 inch wheels is the most efficient EV in the U.S. with 140 MPGE combined. Now, we're going to ignore the fact that the MPGE rating is horrible and move on. That's not stopping Hyundai from improving the car even further. Now, contrast this approach of constant improvement, constant updates with Tesla's. Tesla also has constant improvements and constant updates, but they don't significantly change the exterior of the vehicle. Hyundai seems to be doing this. They seem to be changing the headlights up front. They're going to change some of the rear details. They're going to make it very obvious to even people who are not EV enthusiasts that this is a different car from last year's model, and they don't have to be parked side by side for you to know the difference. The 2025 Ionic 5 currently includes an 84 kilowatt hour battery up from 77.4 kilowatt hours with a bigger battery. The Ionic 5 refresh should get up to 300 miles of range in Korea. That's up from 285 in the old model. The new electric SUV also gains slightly faster charging, enabling it to go from 10% to 80% in 18 minutes and the addition of a rear windshield wiper. Another company that hopes to follow in Hyundai's footsteps of reinventing itself as an electric brand is Jeep. Jeep is hoping to challenge Rivian and Tesla Cybertruck with a new electric gladiator that we've been waiting for. Although it won't hit the market for another few years, Jeep hopes the upcoming Gladiator EV will be able to fend off top-selling rivals like Rivian's R1S, R1T, and Tesla Cybertruck, all of which are stealing sales from the more conventional Wrangler. In fact, Jeep is facing its slowest U.S. sales year in over a decade. The automaker sales have fallen 21% year over year in the second quarter. That's despite an overall market that's grown about 10% and an EV market that's grown at just under 20%. However, there is hope. According to UAW contracts, Jeep plans to launch an electric Grand Cherokee, Wrangler, and Gladiator models. And although Jeep has yet to officially announce the new EVs, we do have a few clues about what to expect. Namely, that the Wrangler and Gladiator are likely to retain a lot of the original styling from the gas-powered versions. Now, that's significant because Jeep buyers tend to like the way Jeeps look, especially Wrangler buyers. There is that deep connection and deep tie in Wrangler lore to the old Willys Jeep from the 1940s. Another group of customers who's really deeply entrenched in tradition and heritage are Mack truck buyers. That's why it's really exciting to see someone like Pitt, Ohio, which is a major logistics fleet in the Midwest, choose to purchase a number of Mack MD electric trucks and give them a try in their Pennsylvania operations. Quote, Mack Trucks is proud to support Pitt, Ohio and its emissions reduction efforts, explained Jonathan Randall, president of Mack Trucks North America. We look forward to continuing to work with Pitt, Ohio and our other battery electric vehicle customers as they navigate the sustainability journey and offering a complete ecosystem of support. Now, despite BEVs making up just 1%-ish of the company's fleet, they are planning for EVs to become a bigger piece of their total asset pie. In fact, this purchase, despite being 1% of the total fleet, is about 7% of Pitt, Ohio's annual truck buy. So this is actually a bigger deal than it seems, because if you expand that number into next year's truck buy and they double this order, then it's going to be closer to 15 or 20% of their overall annual truck buy. Now, a major company like Pitt, Ohio, making moves to electrify at that pace, at that rate, is something that a lot of people in the industry are going to be paying attention to. They're going to want to see how it goes, and they're going to be more confident if Pitt, Ohio has a positive experience. Now, there was a study that came out recently by Rider Trucks that got a lot of things wrong about electrification, and I can effectively boil it down to this. If you're buying an EV and treating it like a diesel, it ain't going to work. You have to use the right tool for the right job, and you have to use that tool in the manner in which it was designed. Now, someone who absolutely gets this is Paul Joppas. Paul is the CEO of a company called Zeme Solutions, and Paul is our guest today on the Extra Long episode. Thanks for having me, Joe. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, and Paul, I, you and I hit it off real well at ACT, so I expect that this is going to be a, a pretty tight interview. But for uh, people who aren't familiar with Zeme Solutions, what is it that you guys are doing? What is the, uh, what's the elevator pitch? Appreciate that, Joe. Um, what Zeme does, we first of all, we started back in 2017. What we do is we design, construct, and operate EV infrastructure for light-duty, medium-duty, and heavy-duty fleets. 
mainly focused on medium and heavy duty fleets. We're doing that at ports. We're doing that at airports and directly right at customer sites. Our first depot is here in LAX, and we're starting to roll these out across the country as we speak. Now, what is life like at your LAX facility for somebody who wants to use that, for somebody who doesn't really understand what this kind of infrastructure as a service thing looks like? What's a day in the life there? Great question. Um, first of all, we're 24-7, 365. So what ends up happening is if I start at midnight, at midnight, our team is very much charging all of the domicile vehicles that park there overnight. We're also performing service and maintenance work. So one of the big benefits of working with an as a service like us is that we make sure we keep the uptime. So we're doing that service and maintenance work at night. Very, very busy after midnight doing charging and service and maintenance. Starting at about four o'clock in the morning, we get a lot of the airport operators that start to come and pick up their vehicles. So between four, four and five is quite a bit of that activity. The ports don't start opening up and getting active until about 6 a.m. So a lot of our tractor uh, customers and box trucks, they'll start queuing up there at about five to six o'clock in the morning. And then uh, sort of post seven o'clock, all those fleets that are domiciled and park with us overnight are out doing their business. Then we start to bring in what we call our contract charging customers. Those are customers that just come in, charge and leave. So we, want, we work with a number of car rental companies, a bunch of different ride share companies. And uh, what we do is we perform charging for them throughout the day as well. Um, and then at nighttime service that domicile vehicle. The one thing that happens throughout the day, Joe, is between four o'clock and nine at night is our uh, peak time here for our electricity usage. So we try to dial down to literally no charging between four and nine o'clock. Um, and so uh, there's a nice little lull between four and nine where we'll stagger vehicles up that as soon as 901 comes on, we turn the energy on and start uh, the process all over again and charge from one, uh, 901 right to that midnight, start it back all over again. I, that sounds like an incredible operation, man. So there's a ton of complexity, a ton of moving parts there. Uh, when you mention that you're doing all the service and you're doing all of the, uh, the nest, let's call it maintenance, right? Not service. There's a pretty broad variety in terms of the fleets that utilize your service. I imagine there's some e-transits, there's some F-150 Lightnings, all the way up to the class eight semi-trucks and a bunch of box vans in between. How do you ensure that the work that your techs are doing is up to those like warranty or manufacturer standards? A really good question. Look, um, if you're going to contract with Zeme, we need to make sure that we know the equipment in in incredibly well from the entire architecture of the vehicle. So what we do is if a customer comes to us, let's take uh, uh, Anheuser-Busch, I run BYDs. We're going to go, we're going to find out everything about the BYD product. So then that way, when it's on our site, we could troubleshoot it. It is 100% uh, core to the business. If we don't understand the architecture of the vehicle, we won't take it in as a contract. So it's very, very important that we do know them all. Now, you know, and you've been at ACT, there's a lot of nascent OEMs. Really, really challenging to have a team that can understand everything from a Tesla to an uh, e-transit to a Exos Lightning Systems, C Electric, and you name it, all the way up to the Volvo and Daimler level and everything in between. The good news is EV is not very complicated. A lot of the componentry is similar. So our team is very, very fluid in understanding the architecture of the vehicle, how to, re how to repair them, how to troubleshoot them. And we also do warranty work for most of these OEMs as well. So I, as I close out here, you've got the LAX facility up and going. You're working on some drainage stuff at Long Beach in New Jersey. That seems to be the 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 low hanging fruit. Once the ports, I mean, and it is a ridiculous thing to say, so I acknowledge that up front. Once we've gotten through the airports and the ports, you know, the 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 dry docks and and wet ports of the country. Where do you see the next big phase of commercial electrification? How does Zeme play into it? And um, yeah. Really good question. Um, right now, railheads, I would associate similar to ports, right? But I would tell you that, you know, a lot of the future is going straight into the customer yard. We all know many of the fleets that already jumped first, right? And they jumped first and then they realized, oh, no, I paid too much for my truck. And, oh, I designed my infrastructure the wrong way. There was never a Zeme who could build it and operate it for you. So now the easy button's there. We're getting every major fleet coming in and saying, you got to build this right in my backyard. Well, you have an LAX. Can you bring that in my backyard? And the difference between Zeme and others, we'll only do that if we're operating it. 
Because if we operate it, we know we get the efficiency, that 99% uptime. Everybody wants an SLA in this market. It's really hard to do that unless you're 24-7, 365, and you really know your stuff. You got to know the charger. You got to know the vehicles. Three years of operating experience, we've seen it all. We've seen it all. And I think that that's the education that we bring. So I foresee this now, port, airport, those obvious ones, and railheads. It's going to go right into the customer yard, and that infrastructure is going to be fluid at the yard. That'll be next. Paul, I, you know, we're actually ahead of time. Usually I do these, and they're an hour long, and I got to trim it down to 20 tight minutes. But this was really good. I will just simply say thank you for being on the show. Uh, if there's anything that you would like to plug or promote, any websites that you'd like people to go check out, how do people find them? How do people keep track and follow along with what you're doing? Um, I appreciate that, Joe. I mean, the one thing I would say, just overarching to your audience, EV uh, trucks are here. Like it's time now, right? The costs are getting there. There's companies like Zeeman, others who are similar to us that can provide this service. It works for routes that are 250 to 300 miles or less. Let's not even talk about anything that's above that. If we could stay in that category, EV trucking and fleet is incredibly exciting. It's such a great growth area that's coming. Of course, if you're a fleet transportation company, logistics company, you want to look at electrification. And uh, right now we're one of the t uh, leaders in the world doing that. So please reach out. Um, our website is fairly informative. It's fairly uh, uh, cryptic for a reason because we do a lot of stuff that's important IP. But again, EV trucks are here. They're here to stay. And costs are only going to get uh, lower and performance is only going to get better. And that's zemesolutions.com. That's not like, you know, zeme pet sitting or anything. Correct. So zemesolutions.com, correct. So once again, that's Paul Giappas from Zeme Solutions. Thanks so much for being a part of the show. We're not quite done yet. As you guys know, I like to wrap things up with a conversation about energy and utilities and Michelle Lewis's latest article, the U.S. largest co-located solar and battery storage project is online in Nevada, and it is up and running, fully operational. The Gemini Project, which sits on federal land in Clark County, Nevada, can power approximately 10% of Nevada's peak power demand. NV Energy signed a 25-year power purchase agreement for the energy produced by the plant. And the enormous 690 megawatt project, which Primergy Solar and Quinbrook Infrastructure Partners developed, features 1.8 million bifacial solar panels. The solar arrays are co-located with 380 megawatts of four-hour battery storage to provide 1,400 megawatt hours of clean power after the sun sets. The project's DC coupled storage configuration enables the battery storage to charge directly from the solar panels on site, increasing efficiency. Primergy says it left vegetation in place and implemented thoughtful design to reduce the project's footprint by more than 20%. During the program's development, Primergy and Quimbrook closed on $1.9 billion in debt and tax equity financing for construction and development. It reportedly created 1,300 union and prevailing wage jobs during construction, contributing more than $460 million to Nevada's economy. That's all I've got for today, July 23rd. And if you're disappointed by the fact that there wasn't more politics in it, be sure to like and subscribe anyway. I'm sure we'll be talking about politics again tomorrow.